Well, the harder you practice, the luckier you get. There is a new trend in rugby, and that is spreading the ball as fast as you can down the back line to the wing and wide. Get the ball wide. The wider the ball can go uh, at the back, the better. When you've got a matchbox and you had to light that match, if you went slowly like that, you'd never light the match. Light the match. You're listening to Sports Illustrated Radio on loudradio.tv. Hey. Patrick Simcox, welcome to the Sports Illustrated Show on Loud Radio. How are you today, sir? Good morning, good afternoon. I'm fine, thank you. Excellent. Um, we thought we'd uh, touch base with you just ahead of the, obviously, the protest taking on the Australians, the baggy green in Australia. Um, you looking forward to it much? Early, early mornings? I am indeed. It's one of those times when you get up in the middle of the night and have long days for the next five days after that, but... I try never to miss a ball at that. You don't miss a ball? Wow, that's impressive. I can't say the same for myself. Uh, test matches, I never miss. No uh, and uh, uh, I mean, let, before we get on to this one, you you obviously played in 20 of them yourself. Um, do you remember who your first test scalp was? Um, it was in Sri Lanka, so it would have been... Uh, I can't remember who the first one was, you know, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's Roshan Manhanema. There he's you go. Roshan, eh? Okay, he's a yeah. dear friend of mine. He's the match referee nowadays, you know. Oh, is he? Okay. Well, you you you, you bagged him LBW, uh, but I can't it's find not, any video replays to see if it was actually out. Probably that the one umpire was in New Zealand. The umpire was it Brian Aldridge? He was the umpire that didn't give the first wicket out in the World Cup in '92, and I'm a Donald Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just standing in that series, I remember. Just. Uh, yeah. Just Pat, just looking uh, to the to the series against the uh, Australia at Skulk speaking. Um, you've okay. played uh, you've played five five tests over there um, against Australia, um, but you never played at the Gabba though. Um, well, nobody's ever played at the Gabba. Yeah, there's been no, no tests by South Africa at the Gabba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when but but it's uh, just talking about Aussie fans for a bit, you know. Um, I mean, did you suffer a lot of abuse there, or you know, how, how is it playing in front of those, uh, you know, those Aussie fans? Well, I guess they're very much like uh, when they come out here and play against us in Centurion or something like that. You know, they're quite vociferous and um, they love to have a go at everybody on the boundary. And yeah. They make a point of it, you know. So, unfortunately, or fortunately, in that series, or both those series in Australia, '94 and '90, I think, was '98. I had to take on the role of, of the senior guard and, and, and took on the role of going to the boundary. Okay. It was quite tough there. And, you know, you get a lot of abuse. So, um, you had to, do, you had had to dodge a chicken as well, did you not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they throw things at you, you know, and they throw back <laughs> and ice. And, well, I think they've kind of stopped that thing now. But I used to, in one series, they had a chicken that they were eating chicken and throwing an old, old chicken at me, you know. <laughs> so, um, you get a bit of abuse, but I think not much more than, than we give them out here. But it, it, it's quite, it can get you. It got to a couple of guys in our side at that time, and eventually they couldn't stand me, and I used to have to go and do it. So, yeah. Quite nice. You had to take one, you had to take a chicken for the team there, Pat. For the team, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for the team. Well, and, and, and just looking at the team, the, the, the Aussie team, why? I mean, we talked about this a, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, my thoughts were uh, like South African cricket fans might have a, the view that it, you know, it could be a, almost a walkover for the Proteus over there. But, I mean, I'm sure you'd, you'd, you'd agree that it's, that it's not, you know. I mean, it's never easy beating Australia at home. It's never beating anybody, whether it's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, anybody at home yeah. is always tough. And they feel the same when they come to South Africa. You know, it's really tough to beat us here. But, yeah, they're in a rebuild phase. And, you, and I guess you wouldn't put some of the... You wouldn't put all their players in the same bracket of just a couple of years ago because... You know, they lost a lot of great players, just yeah. like we did, and they're, re they're rebuilding now. But the domestic scene is quite strong. You know, they haven't got many teams. They've only got five or so, six teams in their league. And it's the national game, so a lot of kids play. So the bottleneck builds quite nicely, and they produce a lot of good players. Um, and they know the conditions well, and they, they like us. They, they're quite tough when it comes to, to on the field. You know, they, they don't give an inch. And so it's going to be a really, really hard fought series. Um, and 
you know, there's not much to split there. No, well, I mean, and the, the I mean, talking the Gabba, the no side has beaten them there since uh, Viv Richards and the Windies in 1988. Um, South Africa were the first side to beat them in a Test series at home in 15 years in 2009. So there's a bit of history beckoning for this Proteus side if they can get it right to a go back to back in Australia and b to end a, a very long unbeaten record for the Australians at the Gabba. Uh, well, let's do with the Gabba. Let's do with the Gabba first. Yeah, um, the Gabba has never been one of the major test venues okay okay and so the, in the past the teams that have played at the gabba have been the minor teams that have toured there okay so you you had test matches up in cairns as well you know so a lot of them if you, if you really dissect the, the gabba test series or the test matches you'll find that they've played a lot against non-south africa or england um you know bangladesh might have toured there sri lanka in the old days and they'd give the Gabba a test match. They wouldn't give a, seri- a test match at Sydney or Melbourne to Bangladesh. So hence the records kind of, you, you know, you've got to be careful of reading too much into the, to the Gabba. They wouldn't give them a wonder. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the fact that we haven't played there. That's true. And that they haven't play- beaten anybody. Nobody else has beaten them well. The Sides have played them. They couldn't beat them anyway, no matter where they played. <laughs> so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, I think the pitch at the Gabba when I played there a couple of times, not only in the test matches and, and, and of late, it's always had good carry. It's very much like Durban, the, the temperature, and it's got good, quite good carry. In fact, it's a better carry than Kingsmead because Kingsmead's got a bit of, test, a bit of tennis ball bounce. The Gabba comes through quite nicely. But again, like Durban, you know, um, we all know that the ball nips around early on with the new ball. And so the opening batters have got a really important role there. And I don't see that you're going to have 40 overs by spinners in the test match in a row. That's never been the case at the Gabba. And you may look at the records as well, and you'll find that I think I think, I think think the record something like 23 tests there, <clears throat> six, 17 wins, and six draws. Okay. So oh, that's their record, I think, yeah. um, in, in over a 23-year period or 17-year period, whatever. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's the Gabba out the way. Yeah. Um, the, the next question you're asking is um, in terms of playing at the Gabba, um, can we win? Is that what you're asking? Or South Africa going back-to-back back in Australia? I mean, the... Well, yeah, I think every series starts from naught. You know, it's like a final. Western Province playing the Sharks, you know, in, in the final. It's always 50-50. Um, it doesn't matter when, whether you've been one, three years ago, or four years ago, you get new personnel. However, the one single difference that we've got this time is we pitch up there now having known how to win and that it is very possible. In the past, we've always arrived there with this daunting prospect of that no one's ever beaten Australia, and really it's quite tough, and they keep telling you that when you get there from day one. So from now on, we actually arrive there, and that's a subtle difference. Graham Smith and his team, and the Gary, know how to win there. They know that it's possible, and they can be beaten. So that's a very subtle difference there. And Australians know that too now. So, and there are a couple of players in that Australian side that have, they were in the side that got beaten. Mm. So I remember that well, like the Ricky Pontings and Michael Clocks. They'll know that they, they were beaten there before and they can be beaten again. So they'll be telling each other in the change room, listen guys, these, these South Africans are going to be tough to beat, you better believe it. Yeah, well, and they also, I mean, they're, they're, they're without Shane Watson first up, he's out with a calf injury. Ed Cowan's obviously under pressure for his test spot, averaging less than 30 in his test career. Okay, it's only seven tests in, but it's still the, the Aussies like to put the pressure on, on, on guys that, that, that they want performing, particularly up the order. David Warner, is he necessarily a, a, a natural test batsman? And then aside from Clark and Ponting, Mike Hussey's got a test average of only 33 against the Proteus. So their batting lineup looks a bit tentative, for want of a better word, particularly against that um, attacking um, quartet that we've got, if you want to call Jack an, an attacking quartet at the moment, as part of that quartet. But... Um, it certainly bodes well in terms of if you, what you're saying, the green topped with Kerry. Um. No, there's no doubt in my mind that from a from an experience and a batting point of view, the records tell you that, yes, Australia right now are not at full strength that they'd like to be. And, and I guess, you know, Shane Watson being injured for the first test is like telling us Jock Ellis has been injured for the first test match. Yeah. He doesn't only leave a batting hole and a bowling hole, but he leaves... He leaves. There's an X factor to Shane Watson that that the Australians are, they love having. So 
Um, losing Shane Watson is, is a massive blow. There's no doubt about it. And then, you know, the new wicketkeeper is also making a debut. And, and I say that's important because if you go with the theory that there's going to be a lot of fast bowling used throughout the test match, where you're going to have, you know, three or four slips in the beginning, you're going to have a gully, you're going to carry them for long periods, three slips, wicketkeeper. I think that the team that catches the best behind the wicket will probably prevail. And I say that because both sides have got batsmen that if you give them a half a chance, they will make you pay. And those half chances are more likely to come from behind the wicket now because there's a lot of fast bowling. And the wicketkeeper plays an important role here. Not only does he, he give direction to Clark in terms of angles, he also sets the, where the, the slips stand, and he himself has got to be, you know, he's in his, in his debut test match. So the tension is there. Um, and so that slip cordon, you know, half a chance flying past somebody in the right hand, it's dropped or goes over the head, or you've seen catches go between slip and go to wicket keeper. Those are the half chances that come in test matches. And that, I think that's where the test match is going to hang on half chances. Uh, Pat, the the one thing I'd, I've always wanted to talk to you about because you were obviously you were a spin bowler picked for South Africa for your bowling, but um, it's your exploits with the bat that live long in a lot of the memories, especially that uh, that hundred as a as a number ten in uh, in Johannesburg. Um, yeah. But prior to that Test match, you because that was against Pakistan, you'd been on tour in Pakistan and you picked up two fifties in one Test match, including one as a as a night watchman. Um, and and the bowling lineup, just so I can remind you and the listeners out there in terms of who you were facing, Wasim Akram, Waka Yunus, Mushtaq Ahmed, Saklan Mushtaq and Azam Mahmood, and then Shoab Akhtar in Johannesburg came in for Yunus. Um, do you, and then obviously yeah. that, that, that wondrous test, it was a bloody Valentine's Day for South Africa, 166 for 8 on day 1. You came to the crease with Mark Boucher in only his second test. And that ninth wicket partnership is still the highest in test cricket for the ninth wicket. Um, yeah. do, do, do you have many fond memories of, of that innings? Or did it, uh... No, I do. I, I absolutely right, I do. Um, you know, as a sportsman, you, you go through phases in your career where um, things got run for you and you've got momentum, whether it's for the ball or the bat, you know. Um, I, I, if I take go back in my career, I, I, I've started out as a young guy, as a batsman, really. And so I opened the batting for a long time and batted in the middle order, three, four. I remember batting for, for Northern Transvaal at number three. And and then, you know, I had a period where I retired twice and then came back into the, into the South African side really as a spinner at age 33. So I kind of was past my batting. I, I, I was really a better batsman than a, better, than a bowler when I was younger. I guess that helped me a lot in the middle of my career when I was 35, 36, when um, I was, I, I'd learned the skill of bowling but I still could bat a bit. Mm. And then there comes a time where you go through phases where you practice quite hard on your batting and you work, and it works for you. And I was very really blessed that over the years I was able to read spin quite well um, for whatever reason, and maybe it was because I was a spinner. Um, and I was never really good off the bat foot as a batsman, but I kind of had a way to deal with it. And maybe it was just experience, you know, that I, I, I got away with it. But uh, there was a two-year period where it ran for me as a batting, as a batsman. And I had a deal with Hansi Kronje at the time that, um, you know, you look back on your career and you think back at now, and if, you know, if you're a tail end batsman batting at sort of 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, if you're going to average 30, 35 with a bat, you kind of, kind of as a bowler that can average 30, 35, you make a major contribution to the team. Yeah. And my deal was that I would try and be 25 every time I bat. And I stuck with that with him. You know, all he was saying is, if your numbers 8, 9, 10, 11 have a deal, you don't have to score 100, just score 25. And if you have that, that kind of mindset and uh, you stick to it, more often than not, I was able to get 25. And if you do get to 25, go on. Mm. And, um, and it worked for me for a period of time where I, I, I found good batting form and I worked pretty hard with Graham Ford down in Natalia. And I went through a good run. So I was lucky. But I remember that innings very well. I remember Bauchi being a young boy walking in there. In fact, I can remember the first, that was the first time Shah I ever bowled in a game in South Africa. And he was just new. I'm not sure how many tests he played. In fact, it could have even been his daily test. But we heard about this guy who, who, who runs in from a long way, he's got long hair, and he bounces in, and he's quite pacey. We'd also heard that he's got a bit of a loose arm, you know. So I remember sitting in the change in that first morning, and he ran in. And there was a bit of a scramble for, for 
<laughs> everything that you could save yourself from. Like I remember Adam Bacher and Gary Kirsten actually opened the batting. And uh, we were sitting there watching Chab run in. And he had a blue arm guard underneath a half cut sleeve. That was our first sign we knew. Uh oh, here we go. It was like a thunderbolt. And people started running for cover. We need extra start pad, gun guards, the lot. And we looked again, we were in trouble at 160 for eight. And I was just fortunate enough to get in and, you know, I just hung in there. So, I mean, so the the idea that people out there have, I mean, I know you can't score a test hundred on a fluke, but the idea that a lot of people have that it was sort of almost a fluke, is uh, totally misguided, then, Pat. Uh, you know, it was. I, I, I got close a couple of times. You know, in my daily test match, I look back. I think Sri Lanka. I think I got a forty-eight and a fifty-two in the first test match, and then I think the second test, um, I was there. I batted for about two hours and a while. And, John T got a hundred. I've batted quite a lot of times that I'd got to thirties and forties and fifties and not kind of converted because I was batting down the order. And yeah. as a bat, as a lower order batter, you always dream of the time where you get in and somebody's there with you that you can bat and it's a nice day. So um, as someone as you were saying just now, uh, the series before that, you know, I missed out on a hundred when I got an eighty two in the one one innings and I got a fifty in the second. Yes. And I probably missed out on getting 101 of those yeah. you know, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, happy, I'm happy. I'm glad I scored 100 in the test match. If I didn't, well, it wouldn't have mattered. I was just proud of the fact that we, we won the test match and it contributed greatly to the series. And then I batted with Bauchi, you know, and Bauchi came in as a young boy and went on to play over 100 odd test matches and had a great career. And we have, a, we have something in common. And in fact, I'm not sure that there's another. I don't think so. They didn't figure to have another world record in those ten batting partnerships. I don't no, think the, they, it's the only one standing. Only one, you know? and I think that's the, the only South African world kind of recording thing that that there is. You know, yeah. the partnership, you know? so, and so, it was the first time uh, uh, somebody batting at number ten. I think it's caught a hundred in over a hundred years in, yeah. in that. You know, so I don't know. I hope it lasts. I know that the the one we broke was Asif Iqbal and somebody. From 1961, so that stood quite a long time. That's right, yeah. and then and then JP and Dale came close. They got close actually. We were actually I was sitting watching there, and I was thinking, oh, yeah, we got <laughs> broken. You know, some way, some way, sometime, somebody's going along. Somebody had a school of thought the other day. It was one of the players, and they couldn't even be about you. Know, and he was saying that the change in modern cricket now, we have got a lot of reverse swing at the end, and not that there wasn't then, but it's quite tough for number ten and eleven to get hundred now. You know, you you wouldn't bat too many number tens around the world to walk in and get a hundred because of lots of fast bowlers bowling reverse swing and um, the game might have changed a little bit. So it's going to be tough to break two hundred. So how many meetings were there uh, just after that innings, um, or how many heated debates to get you up the order there, Pat? I was always up for the order. <laughs> <laughs> I was always keen about the fact in the one days I was I used to fight with. H with Ansi often get me up in order. You know, I always felt that batting at number four, five, and six is the easiest place to bat. You know, that's when the fast bowlers are off, the spinners are on, the ball's a bit older. That's heaven. That's paradise. Yeah. Um, and, and and guys think, oh well, you come down the back end, you can have a slog. Well, you go and walk in at number nine or ten, and you've got was a Macram or Waka Yunus or Alan Donald bowling. You walk in there and go and try and slog a reverse swinging ball at 145. Exactly. Yeah. That easy, but when you're in the middle order, they kind of have got four oaks in the ring, spinners are bowling, we get 20 by just knocking a single, run a ball. Yeah, yeah. You run a ball, everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever get your wish though? Did you have a few? I did, you know, I, I, I did actually. I, I think we went to England, and I, I, I'd need to check the record, but I, I remember we played a three one day series against England, okay. and I got my wish, and I actually said, go, okay, go up number five, and I got 50. <laughs> I was so tired. I remember the first. I, I think I was man of the series in that series actually. Okay. But I, I got a fifth in the first innings in, in the first game, and I was so tired. I was batting with John here. We were running so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think I batted with Hansi for about 20, 20 runs. Then he got out, and I batted with John here. I got you fifty. I never forget where Lipson was bowling, and 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 uh, I was so tired. I said to Joe, "Listen, I can't run anymore. I'm going to have a slog. If it's either six, four, or I'm out." <laughs> 
But I can't run anymore. I'm too tired now. <laughs> and I had a slump and I had a cold and deep and wicked. The only reason why I got out was I was so tired. I needed somebody else to come and bat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's easy to bat there, but it's a, that's one thing to bat there, but it's another thing to rip and run with these guys in the middle order, and I was too old. And the Gunstons don't help. Uh, they don't. Help. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, one thing I, d- I did want to talk to you, as a, as a former uh, ODI bowler, uh, your thoughts on the, on the new ICC rules that are restricting the number of outfielders to four, even outside the power plays? Um, you know, Mahela Jawarden has come out and said that it heavily favours the batsmen and, and is effectively could nullify the use of spinners in, in one-day cricket. Yeah, I think I think it will have a change on the game. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt about it, you know. And I think as a mindset, I, I just watched provincial cricket this weekend, and I was watching um, the Dolphins playing the Cobras, you know. And I, th- I saw there that the Dolphins actually lost right at the end in, in cold blood. And really, um, the change there was a subtle change in the field placings, and and it's something we need to understand. That will ha- it will have an effect. There's no doubt. Whether it's going to affect spinners, I don't believe that. You know, they came in and they said, oh, 2020 cricket, uh, that's the end of spin. You know, a guy's going to slog them. Well, they proved to be the best bowlers. Um, there'll always be a way around. I think the biggest change that's going to happen in the cricket now is two bounces in another. Mm. Now, that's going to be a major change because, uh, you know, when you start taking the percentages of two out of six um, are, are going to be short balls, plus you can push, push a guy back three or four balls, if you don't play well off the back foot nowadays in cricket, I think you're going to battle to score quite freely. So you're going to see that in our domestic season and you're going to see that in, 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 at the international level. If you can't score off the back foot, you're really going to be up against it. Because the minute that you, you push you back and you, you look to defend only and you're looking for a drive only, you're not going to get any drives anymore. So you better be scoring off the back foot and you've got two bounces to come. Right? So that could be a major change. You just uh, touched on, um, on on domestic cricket there uh, quickly, Pat. Is um, what are your thoughts on the on on the current domestic structure um, uh, in South Africa? I mean, is it good? Is it bad? Are you happy with it? I've never been happy with it, to be brutally honest. I am, and I say that because um, a couple of years ago they changed the franchise system down to six, yeah, nine to six, and there were two reasons. One is you know, if you want to give more people more opportunities, disadvantaged people, then I think you need to understand that we need teams from other areas to play. And I come from a small town. I grew up in Kimberley, and Brickwoods is my hometown. You know? and, and we've really battled to, to play a lot of cricket there. And we fought hard. We built a stadium, and, and, and just like they did it in Border. And when they changed, there were nine teams in the franchise. Mm. And they changed them down to six. Now, at the time, I fought really hard about it because... The three teams that are left out of the franchise division, believe it or not, were teams that produced really good cricketers. Yes. One was Bullant, and Bullant really is the backbone of Bullant was Stellenbosch. Yes. And that, 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 that organization has produced a lot of really good sportsmen and a lot of good cricketers. Not only that, it's backed by Johan Rupert, who <laughs> really you want to be involved in cricket. Yes. The next one that dropped out of the system was Brickwoods. Now, Brickwoods have also produced a couple of international cricketers, and they've got a very good domestic development program. Mm. And they've done really well over many years. Mm. Their major sponsor was Nicky Oppenheim, the Bears. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and the third one they dropped out was Border, who have produced lots of black players. And there's a, it's a wealth of talent in Border with magnificent schools. And the their sponsor was Mercedes Benz. Yes. <laughs> so they, they went and turned down and said, okay, we don't want Johan Rupert, Nicky Oppenheim, and. and, and, and and Mercedes. And Mercedes Benz in our system. I mean, that was absolutely ludicrous. Yes. And what has happened, you've got six teams now, that's great. But you lost the identity of and some of those teams, to be brutally honest, don't even make money. The franchises make losses. Yeah. You know, Free State had a loss, a major loss. Rick was trying to buy them out. You know, go and have a look at the Gauteng balance sheet or income statement. I'm sure they make a couple of million rand loss a year. So how are they running as a as a as a business? The franchise is a business. And I really think that um, at some point, you know, they need to relook at it because you need to give other teams opportunities. There are other areas in South Africa that produce cricketers and that shouldn't be restricted to those those four provinces, those six provinces. Similarly in rugby, I mean, I, I know that there's always talk about, you know, the PE franchise getting into the mainstream. But man, you know, Port Elizabeth area is a wonderful area where sport is played. 
and you need to get them into the system because you're going to produce a lot of plastic. And I think uh, I've always been against it and always will be until such time as they relook really at that system and get the... You know, we, Rick was, actually won the trophy and a year or two later got kicked out of the franchise system. This is yeah. actually... Yeah, I mean, I suppose they... I mean, you make a big decision like that and you and then you know you say just wait and see it'll work but it hasn't you know there's no there's, there's been no proof of this system working both as you say in terms of like getting players from those regions through or making money or getting bums on seats well you just look at the up the border case i mean you're looking at selborne you know where you've had the likes of voucher you've had dale college you know i don't have to go about queens you know, there's some wonderful schools, Mackay and Tini, there's, you know, there's been lots of players that have come from the border region, and, yeah. it's, and it's really a strong base to build our development cricket off. And they tell them, and go, sorry boys, but come go play cricket in Port Elizabeth, it's two and a half hours down the day. I mean, really. <laughs> On dodgy roads. I don't know, I, I don't go there, the coach there, you know, you've had Greg Hayes was there, Kenny Watson, they produced, you know, there were some really good players that have come out there, and unfortunately, you know, I think the, the, the passion is lost there. And every now and again, they'll give them a little game. You know, I just can't never hit there. Well, it's not good. I mean, from the fans' perspective as well, I know that I I grew up as a Western Province supporter and the Cape Cobras, they just it's just not the same for me when it comes to... You can't quite get behind them the way you used to get behind your province. Um, so Correct. Correct. I think they diluted the brand. There's no doubt. There's Definitely. no doubt. And you look, you're talking about Western Province playing Borland. I mean, Borland fought for many, many years to get into the mainstream. And eventually they got in, you may remember. And they started to produce lots of good players. I remember playing in the days when Selig Nack had been. And there was, there was some, you know, Stephen Jones went there as the coach. I can remember going back in my first years of, in, of, of provincial cricket a long time ago when Northern Transvaal were in the B section and eventually got into the A section and eventually be, held their own and became a, a strong province and today you know that that's where pretoria is so uh, I, 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 at the time the decision was made i was against it and i always will be against it. let's leave it at that yeah, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> pat before we let you go could, do you have any memories on the best ball you ever bowled sure um i bowled a lot of them <laughs> <laughs> i bowled a lot of balls um, you know, I, I wouldn't say best, but maybe maybe fond ball, fond memories of ball that stick in your mind. I remember, I remember it was a, a test match at um, at Eden Gardens in Calcutta. And if you ever go to Eden Gardens in Calcutta, you know it holds 110,000 people. When you play a test match against India, it's a, it's a massive occasion, and there was, the ground was full because India were batting, and we've been speaking about how we we, um, we need to get some of the top players. And, Session was betting at four, and you know, a couple of really good players. And um, I remember they got off to a bit of a start, and the wicket fell, and another wicket fell, and, and uh, I, I happened to come on to bowl the one side, and the wicket fell, and in walked Session Tendulkar. You know? And we, you know, you have these team meetings. Where every cricket player has had a team meeting where <laughs> they talk about how you're going to get this guy out, and it's normally, you know, you bowl outside off stump with a bit of bounce, or nick him off. And when it comes to talking about how you're going to spin, they forget about it. Anyway, so they got a bit of a start, and I had to come on and bowl an over or two, and Hansi just bowled from this end, and I went session and just walked in. I think he had four. He, he, he got four runs off one ball. Got down to that end. I bowled the first ball to him, and he blocked it, but all the bat was no problem. Picked the ball up. I, I, my second ball, and I bowled another one, and it bounced and turned. and came off the shoulder of the bat, caught short leg by Gary Kirsten. Out for four. Second ball I bowled. And as I looked up, you know, when session gets out, people just leave the ground. And, and as he was walking out, so were 50,000 people. <laughs> they got off the seat and just walked out. And we were just looking around the ground thinking, where are these people going? And somebody said, well, Sessions got out. And what do you think? Thanks a lot, Pat, some cocks. <laughs> and it wasn't anything special. I just bowled the ball. And as I bowled, I looked up, I saw it bounce. And I, I thought, hang on a second. Let's come off short. Let's come off the edge straight to Gary. And we were crazy. You know, and out he got. You know, just as easy as that. It wasn't a special ball. It just got out. I remember it well. Yeah. Pat Simcox, thanks so much for joining us on the Sports Illustrated Show. Enjoy the test cricket on the weekend. I, for one, can't wait. I think it's going to be a cracker. Um, and, yeah, let's see where things go with domestic cricket in this country. 
Yeah, well, let's hope that Gary gets old thumbs and let's see that the product is, let's hope Dale Stein runs in and Philander and all of them do well. I can see them doing that. Thanks so much for your time, Pat. Enjoy the rest of your week. We'll chat again. Thank you. Cheers, Cheers bye. Cheers, Pat. Thanks. See you. You've been listening to Sports Illustrated Radio on loudradio.tv.